Hello, viewers. I am Susan Gerbic. I was an attendee at the PsychCon 2023 conference held in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Flamingo. It, there will be a 2024 conference held the last weekend of October it, at the Horseshoe Casino, which is very near the Flamingo at the last weekend of October. What you are watching right now is one of the videos on a playlist that has multiple videos that are quick takes that I recorded at SciCon 2023. I am not a vi videographer, which will become clear very quickly. I do not have a professional setup. I was just using my iPhone and I am just recording videos that possibly may not be something that the Center for Inquiry will release on their YouTube channel in 2024. Usually they start in January and they roll out every three weeks or so. Possibly the Sunday papers will be released. I don't know, but I video them every year because the Sunday papers are one of my favorite parts of the conference. What you are watching is the second video. This is Adrian Hill. She is going to be giving a talk on the Winchester Mystery House, but more specifically, Sarah Winchester, whose real name she used was Sa Sally Winchester. Um, this is a very personal page to, to me, um, the Sarah Winchester page and the Winchester Mystery House page, as I've visited very this, several times the Winchester Mystery House. It's about an hour from me. And when I was getting my college degree, I was much later in life getting my BA um, I wanted to research uh, the Winchester Mystery House and Sally Winchester. Well, Sarah Winchester is all I knew her as. And I couldn't find enough reliable sources to be able to do that. Um, it was kind of not pre-internet, but before we had the ability to search on the internet as well as we do. I think I was still using dial-up at that time. My point is that Adrian Hill did a phenomenal job on this Wikipedia page that she rewrote. Her research was wonderful, um, aided by um, a book that uh, that Adrian read, as well as guidance from the Skeptoid podcast Brian Dunning had done, and who pointed out that this Wikipedia page needed to be rewritten. I believe this Wikipedia page, um, the Sarah Winchester page, is is getting thousands of views already. The Winchester Mystery House Wikipedia page is, I think, at a half a million page views since Adrian rewrote it. If you want more information about the Wikipedia project I run, Girl of Skepticism on Wikipedia, GSOW, please reach out to me on social media. And um, I will be happy to give you more information or find our website at abouttimeproject.org, which you are going to hear is Adrian's presentation called The Truth About Sally. And in the description of this video, I have a link that um, gives a bio of Adrian as well as an abstract for this talk. I hope you enjoy. Leave all your comments in the um, comment section of this video. Um, well, let's uh, bring on our next speaker. So uh, for the next talk, we'll, we'll have Adrian Held. She is a former high school mathematics teacher and currently dedicates her time to promoting rational skepticism, thank you, through myriad ways, including as an editor of the Bibliotech Skepticism on Wikipedia, thank you again, writing reports for the Skeptic Zone, and she co-chairs the Western Canadian Reason Conference in Calgary. So today she will talk to us about a mysterious woman behind a famous house in San Jose, California. So please welcome the stage, Adrian Hill. <laughs> Today my talk is going to be about Sarah Winchester, known for building the apparently haunted Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, and I like to call it that mystery house that never was. 
And this started because of Brian Dunning from Skeptoid. And he investigated Sally Winchester for his Skeptoid podcast, and then he subsequently notified somebody who's been mentioned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know who this is. And she said, we need somebody to redo this page. Brian Dunning says it's all full of untruths and needs a really big overhaul. And I decided to take on that project. And little did I know that I would spend the next year and a half reading and rereading and researching, and she became a real friend. And as I continued my research, I became really angry because she was portrayed as crazy, superstitious, and guilt-ridden. And this is not who I discovered and found she was. And it started actually back when she was alive. Fake news existed in 1895 as well. And in this newspaper, in the San Jose Daily News, it was dated March 29, 1895, and the title was Strange Story, A Woman Who Thinks She'll Die When Her House Is Built. Ten years ago, the handsome residence was apparently ready for occupancy, but improvements and additions are constantly being made for the reason it is said that the owner of the house believes that when it is entirely completed, she will die. This superstition has resulted in the construction of a maze of domes, turrets, cupolas, and towers covering territory enough for a castle. Now, other news, other journalists at the time did try to combat this. They, they interviewed the staff and friends of Sally Winchester. Unfortunately, that is not what stuck till today. And the first thing that I'm going to um, get rid of is the myth of her name. She's called Sarah Winchester in everything that I found in writing, except for Brian Dunning's Skeptoid podcast and Mary of Nardo's book. So I am going to start calling her Sally. You probably noticed I've already started. And she was born Sarah Lockwood Party, but her paternal grandmother died shortly after, and her family decided to call her Sally after her paternal grandmother. She signed all her correspondence with Sally, everybody called her Sally. And so I'm going to honor that and call her that. A little bit about her. She was born in 1839, married William Wirt Winchester in 1862. He was the son of the founder of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. And they had a daughter in 1866 who actually died a month later from a horrible thing called marasmus. She essentially starved to death. She couldn't digest food properly. 14 years after that, in 1880 to 1881, she lost three beloved family members. Her mother, father-in-law, and her husband. Will, her husband, died from tuberculosis. And at this time, Sally's own health had started to deteriorate due to rheumatoid arthritis. And the next correction I'm going to consider going to make is her house, her house name. It was actually called Yanadavia. Now, I probably didn't do a great job of that, I apologize. But she named it after the Basque area of Spain, because that's where her husband and her had traveled, and she loved it, and it reminded her of their times together. And she bought a two-story, eight-room farmhouse in the Santa Clara, Mar Santa Clara Valley, and her sisters and family came along with her, probably because they paid for it. She paid for it. She paid for their move, and she wanted her family around her. And she decided to renovate this home and became the project manager and chief architect. And this was actually a natural progression. At the time, this was very unusual. Women didn't, weren't allowed to do that. But when she was in New Haven with her husband, when they built a home together, and they developed a hobby of architecture and interior design, so she, this is a perfect opportunity for her to expand on this hobby that she had. She did try and hire a couple of architects, but wasn't happy with them. She had very exacting standards. So we can consider Sally an architectural pioneer. And unfortunately, it was this independence that resulted in rumors of her being irrational and superstitious. And mainly because the project lasted for a very long time, many, many years. In 1922, Sally did die, and the house was in such disrepair, and I'll find out why later on, that it couldn't be sold. And it was sold eventually to John and Nanny 
Brown, who leased it originally and eventually purchased it. And they immediately turned it into an attraction. Essentially the attraction it is today, but they, they've made it bigger. And it was open nine months after her death. And as you know, it still is open. And I'm going to now discuss the claims that I found over the years, the last year and a half, versus the reality. Aren't they cute? They're <laughs> And I have found this in newspapers, online articles, and in the actual tourist books from the house. So these are the most common that I have found. First claim is about her inheritance. She received a thousand dollars in royalties from the Winchester uh, Right for Fortune, and it was a $20 million inheritance. I saw this everywhere. And I even saw higher values than this reported. This is the most common one that I saw. And make no mistake, Winchester really was wealthy for her time. So when you see these next numbers, they're a lot smaller, but she was still very wealthy and could do with whatever she wanted. But they're just grossly exaggerated. So the reality is she made $21 per day in royalties for about five years after her, five, uh, her husband's death. And her initial inheritance was $77,000. It's a little different. So I was thinking, well, maybe somebody somewhere along the line, like find no evidence for this, use some kind of inflation calculator. So I went to the CPI inflation calculator to find out what I could get. And what I found then is that the $21 per day equates to $638 dollars per day. So we're getting closer. And the total inheritance would be about 2.3 million. We're still a far cry from that 20 million. So the next thing I was wondering is she did get another inheritance later on, many years later. She did receive in 1898 $300,000 in stock. And that would equate today to about $11 million. So if you add them together, we get 13 million. We're still not there. So I think that these are greatly exaggerated, and I'm not really sure where they get these numbers from. Never was able to figure it out. So the other claim is that she held nightly seances in the blue room or a closet all by herself. And she was speaking to the spirits to find out what she should do next on her construction project. The reality is there's actually no evidence she ever had a seance. The staff stated she had no interest in things like that. In addition, solo seances at that time were not something that was done. They were, they were a group social thing. And the last thing is, according to the records, the blue room was actually the gardener's bedroom. A little different than a seance room. Another rumor, or more, is that she held spirit parties. And these parties were elaborate, but no alcohol. These are the other kind of spirits. And they were really lavish, and she apparently served the ghosts food on gold plates. And she kept these plates in her safe. The reality is, they did open the safe after her death. They found no gold plates. All they found were some me me mementos and a lock of her baby's hair. Sounds pretty normal to me. In the magazines, and I found this on several places, they said, well, she wasn't a churchgoer. She didn't go to church. That's why she was part of the spiritualist movement. And that she sought the advice of a medium in Boston. And that medium was identified as being named Adam Coons. And he convinced her to build a house for the spirits of all the people that were killed by the rifles made by the Winchester Arms Company, leading to that guilty thing. She's guilty about the deaths caused by the rifle. The reality is, she was actually pretty active with churches, both in Connecticut, where she lived, and originally, and in California, where she moved. And it is unlikely that she felt any guilt at all for her deaths, or for not her deaths, for the deaths of the Winchester repeating rifles, because at that time they were rifles were reviewed, were viewed as necessary for survival. And she actually stayed on the board until her death, as far as I know. So she stayed on board. If she'd been guilty, I don't think she would have done that. And extensive research was done that revealed that there was no evidence that Adam Coons even ever existed in Boston. Couldn't find any evidence. However, it first started appearing in print in 1967 in a book called Prominent American Ghosts, written by Susie Smith. Next claim. She's superstitious and crazy. 
And it was fueled, I think, by her witnessing behavior. She had stuck her family, her staff, her close friends, and that was it. Led to a lot of gossip about her odd behavior. And they claimed she was mad. In reality, she was reclusive and kept to herself because she had difficulty moving around because of her arthritis and disfigurements. And she may have been aware that she was losing her teeth and but quite self-conscious of it. She didn't, she, I mean, it was pretty common at the time, really just don't want to be seen. I like this one. Apparently the bell tower was used to summon spirits, but it's a much more simple explanation. She had to have some way of calling everybody to work. She used the bell tower. And it was also used as a fire alarm every once in a while, if it needed to be. According to people living in the area, they would hear ghostly music radiating from the house. Well, that must be ghosts, right? Spirits. However, the reality is she, she played the pump organ. And she couldn't sleep because of the pain that she was experiencing from her arthritis. And she quite often would play music in the middle of the night. And what's also interesting is they call it the Grand Ballroom when you go on the tour, and it was actually the music room. It was a much smaller room. The ballroom got destroyed later. She was obsessed with the number 13. It's my favorite number. And this, these are some of the examples. Well, there were 13 bathrooms, and there's 13 windows in one bathroom. Wondering about the other bathrooms, do you? 12 uh, there's, 13 steps on a staircase, and I found evidence that there's actually other staircases with 7 and 11 steps. And one of them had 42 or something like that. That's a good number. And 13 candles on a German chandelier that originally had 12 candles, and apparently she just decided, oh, I want to put another candle on there. <laughs> just because she loved 13 so much. Well, the reality is, according to James Perkins, who worked on the property for many years, that they appeared as later additions after her death. They were not done while she was alive. And the first mention of the number 13 related to this house appeared in print in 1929, which was seven years after Sally's death. And the workmanship, think about the workmanship that she was able to afford. She could afford whatever she wanted. Why would she buy a German chandelier, bring it over, plunk on a 13th candle by herself. I think she would have ordered a 13th candle if that's what she really wanted. The claim. Her nonsensical construction included stairs that led to nowhere. Doors that opened to two-story drops. Some doors opened to solid walls. And the reason was often cited that the reason it was like that is she wanted to confuse the spirits that were haunting her. And these claims, again, started while she was alive. The reality is she was an inexperienced architect, and she had a lot of money to play with. So she would build something good, and like that, collapse it, build it again. Build a wing around a corner that blocked off a door so that you couldn't use that door anymore. And she was inexperienced, and it was trial and error. And the second reason that it's so crazy is something that happened in 1906, which was the San Francisco earthquake. Most of the whole house that she built was destroyed. It collapsed. It was up to, I think, five to seven, depending on where it was in the house, five to seven stories. And everything above the second story was lost. So those stairs that went up, that are now boarded off, there used to be another level up there. So there's reasonable explanations for this weirdness that happens in this house. And essentially, at this point, construction stopped. She boarded everything up, made it safe, removed the rubble, and everything halted. I think it really devastated her. She just couldn't face keeping on building this house. She did keep regular maintenance, and people did live there, but she never did rebuilt her home. So this leads to the next claim because they say there was continuous construction round the clock for 38 years until the day she died. And I think based on the last slide, no, that's not true because there was an earthquake, stop there. <laughs> but there is another reason that this is not true. While construction was on, she would take long breaks because her health was bad and she just couldn't manage it. So she would just say, okay, we can't do any more construction. 
And she would dismiss the staff for periods of time to rest, also because of the seasonal issues. You can't build in certain seasons, so she would uh, stop construction. And by the time of the earthquake, she owned close to a dozen properties in the San Francisco area. She had rental properties, and she had two homes in Atherton, and 30 undeveloped acres of land. She, was, she had lots of properties. And according to her relatives and employees, they claimed that she never feared spirits, she never feared death, and Miss Henrietta Service, she was a close personal companion of her until the day she died, said she never had any superstitious beliefs. Now there's a claim that she was trapped and she was in the room screaming and yelling for help for hours after the earthquake. Might be true. This one we don't know, but there's actually no evidence of that story. There's evidence that she wrote to her lawyer from her Atherton property just several days before. So it is, we could surmise that she was actually an Atherton, but we really don't know. But there's no evidence. There's no letters to family saying, I was stranded. Oh my God, this happened to me. Nothing like that. So we don't know. Now, what's really interesting, as you know, I am a Wikipedia editor with Susan Gerbeck. And it's so fun to see what happens when you post a page and you publish a page. And we have this Winchester Mystery House employee try to change it back to all the superstition. What happens? Okay, I'm going to show you what she said. Hi, all. Uh, I will be making edits to this page due to some incorrect and inaccurate information. I am an employee of the Winchester Mystery House, and many of the recent edits were made using one of the only biographies written about Susan Winchester. Susan? Susan. <laughs> <laughs> the Freud author did so. not interview anyone affiliated with the house, wonder why, and many of the edits to this page are opinions. <clears throat> and to show how well the process works, this, her edits were all removed except for one. one little, she, she changed the title, that's all that was allowed to stick. And this is what other editors, these are not GSOW editors, and they kind of come on to these fringe pages and defend them. And so what this person said was, so in this case, we have Joe Nickel, Mary Jo Ignacio, Brian Dunning, Katie Dowd, Colin Dickey, etc., writing in the line with scientific consensus, and also as experts who are, importantly, independent of the monetary incentive to promote mystery, drama, superstition, hype, etc. And just so you know, again, how important this project is, this is as of last week, who knows, it may have taken off. As we get closer to Halloween, this page always just really goes crazy. I've had, since September 9th, 2022, uh, five, uh, you know, half a million views on that page. And Sarah Winchester, I just published it last week, and after just a few days, there were almost 7,000 views on that page. And I'm certainly not getting as much attention on Facebook, TikTok, or Instagram. And I'm kind of working behind the scenes, a little less so now that I'm standing in front of you. But I love that kind of work. It's very powerful to me. So I want you to think, was the real story about Sarah Winchester more interesting than the fiction? In my opinion, yes. The truth is far more fascinating. And I want to take this moment to really celebrate Sally, Sally's life. It is a testament to strength in the face of many adversary, uh, adversities, including the deaths of her daughter, her husband, family, declining health, and unfair accusations while she was alive. And it is time to celebrate these accomplishments, get rid of this false narrative that has survived for far too long. And I believe that if Sally Winchester were alive today, she would most likely have been a leader of a company and even possibly an architectural firm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good help. Thank you. That was a wonderful rabbit hole because of real skepticism. Thank you very much.